Hello, everyone. This is Dominique Gomez from the Colorado State University Salazar Center for North American Conservation. Welcome today to our webinar series, Connecting for Conservation. Today, we're going to talk about indigenous leadership on climate change, and we're so excited to have all of you join us and our two wonderful panelists to present and lead the discussion today. First, I want to just talk a little bit through our agenda. I uh, want to welcome you, and I'll talk a little bit about the Salazar Center. Uh, then we'll have a little housekeeping. Then we're going to hear from our two panelists, and then we'll have plenty of time for a moderated discussion. Uh, and then we'll wrap up. So first of all, just thank you again for joining us. Uh, the Salazar Center for North American Conservation supports and advances the health and connectivity of natural systems and landscapes in North America. Here at the Salazar Center, we know that healthy natural systems support climate adaptation and resilience, protect biodiversity, and support long-term human health. And our intersectional approach builds bridges that connect academic research, community practice, and policy. And you can learn more about us on our website, salazarcenter.colostate.edu. And this is the inaugural webinar in our Connecting for Conservation series. We're really excited. Uh, we're going to explore relevant topics in conservation this year from climate adaptation and resilience, urban forestry, health and equity, to biodiversity and cross-border conservation. And we're actually going to continue this initial focus on indigenous approaches to conservation with a webinar on March 5th. Talk a little bit about that at the end of the hour. With that, I want to go to just some quick housekeeping. Uh, all of our lovely attendees, if you're calling in today to listen to the webinar, you are on mute. So we can't actually hear you, but we do want to hear from you. So please submit your questions and comments through the GoToWebinar control panel questions box. We will be looking at those throughout. Uh, you don't have to wait to the moderated discussion section. Go ahead and submit questions as they come up, as you hear from our panelists. And we'll get to as many questions as we can to today. Um, the session is being recorded. So I know many of you want to share it with your colleagues, or there might be something you want to refer back to. Don't worry. You don't have to take copious notes. We will share out the link of the recording. Uh, if not tomorrow, then certainly early next week. And then lastly, you can learn more about us, as I mentioned, at our website, southrcenter.colostate.edu. You'll be able to see all past recordings of webinars there, as well as learn about future webinars. You can also follow us on Twitter, at Salazar N America, Salazar North America. All right, thank you all for joining us. As I mentioned, please just go ahead and start submitting those questions uh, through those uh, go-to webinar control panel on your right. And with that, I want to go ahead and jump in and get us started by introducing our first panelist. Dr. Beth Rose Middleton is an Associate Professor of Native American Studies at UC Davis. Beth Rose's research centers on Native American uh, environmental policy and Native activism for site protection using conservation tools. Her broader research interests include intergenerational trauma and healing, rural environmental justice, indigenous analysis of climate change, Afro-indigeneity, and qualitative GIS. Beth Rose received her BA in Nature and Culture from UC Davis and her PhD in Environmental Science, Policy, and Management from UC Berkeley. And we are so fortunate to have Dr. Beth Rose join us today. Uh, Dr. Beth Rose, thank you for being here. Thank you so much for that kind introduction. Uh, it's such an honor to be part of this series and to uh, speak with my co-presenter here. I'm speaking to you from Putwin Territories in Central California, at UC Davis, which sits within Putwin Homelands. I was born and raised about an hour and a half east of here in the C Central Sierra Foothills uh, Miwok Territory. And I am really excited to talk with you about some work and partnerships regarding centering tribal leadership in climate adaptation. I'd like to tell you just briefly about this image on the cover. And uh, Ellen Sanders Ragosa is one of our wonderful graduates, uh, undergraduate graduate of UC Davis. She was involved in an internship in partnership with the Intertribal Ag Council and um, NRCS and UC Davis Native American Studies and the Arboretum. And she worked with several tribes, uh, including with the Maidu Summit Consortium in the Northeastern Sierra to gather seeds of culturally important plants uh, and then learn how to uh, grow out those seeds in the UC Davis Arboretum and then contribute to restoration projects on the land. So, so this picture uh, shows her uh, going out and doing some replanting at a community restoration day. 
Okay, next slide, please. So as you all may know, uh, climate change has disproportionate effects on indigenous peoples. The impacts of increasing temperature, increasing aridity, uh, seasonal shifts that impact when traditional foods and traditional plants are blooming and when they're available for harvest, uh, impact the traditional timing as well as the safety of cultural practices and land stewardship. In addition, increasing heat impacts in particular uh, populations, which may include indigenous people, particularly in rural areas, but also in urban areas, who may not have cooling infrastructure, uh, whether or not those are community cooling centers or even just air conditioning in the home. So increasing heat and aridity has direct impacts on individual family and community health. Uh, people are sometimes in vulnerable locations due to a history of relocation and removal from their homelands or enclosure um, on a particular area within their homelands, whereas historically people may have moved back and forth between different places at different times of year under different conditions. Now tribal land bases and areas under tribal jurisdiction may be restricted to only certain environments which may themselves be heavily impacted by climate change. Um, and related to that, there's a lack of indigenous specific funding for relocation when that relocation becomes necessary due to climate-induced displacement. This is happening along the Gulf on the coastline of Louisiana, as well as in Alaska. I've gotten to learn about some of the egregious impacts of uh, climate-induced relocation through the Rising Voices Network and some of the challenges people face when there's not support for them to be able to move in a culturally appropriate way. Next slide, please. So part of my focus and uh, with a lot of joy and collaboration is reframing climate change from indigenous perspectives that really uh, respect the long view of place-based stewardship, the fact that people have been watching these changes over a long period of time and also follow specific ethics of responsibility and relationality and reciprocity, which I know our, our next speaker will be talking about as well, and have very practical relationships as well to local environments. If you take care of the land, it takes care of you is something I've heard uh, from elders in many different places. And also, I think it's very important to note that climate change is never just an ecological, environmental, or physical problem. It's deeply rooted in this history of lack of attention to indigenous expertise, of removal of people from within their homelands, uh, that the impacts, the extensive impacts that people feel today are a result of, of some of those historical and ongoing socio-political economic um, impacts. And I, I also want to say that indigenous knowledge, because people might say, well, you know, indigenous knowledge is changing and adapting with climatic change. Uh, so there are challenges to traditional knowledge around timing of, of gathering and stewardship, but the greater challenges come from a century of oppressive policies, including policies, uh, you know, attempting to stop traditional burning and other landscape stewardship. Indigenous epistemologies of climatic change, I think, are important as a, a guiding framework. Uh, the Yurok tribe recently recognized the personhood of the Klamath River, and other nations are doing this not only within the United States, but around the world. Uh, thinking of Maori and others, who are really recognizing that the world is composed of active and interacting beings, and that our laws and policies should reflect that acknowledgement of working with, with relatives. I also draw on uh, Daniel Wildcat's work on indigenous ingenuity, which he writes about in Red Alert, uh, just the importance of indigenous knowledge and innovation in response to climatic change. Next slide, please. This is a map from the uh, National Climate Assessment 4, which I participated in the Southwest chapter. Um, I think Julie Maldonado and others were involved in putting together this map, which underscores resilience actions by indigenous people all around uh, the US and territories, just underscoring it again, indigenous leadership in dealing with climate change. Next slide, please. So I'll talk briefly about a few key projects I've been involved with. Uh, traditional burning, I'm not a traditional fire practitioner. My role has been more around policy advocacy. How can I contribute to efforts to make space in state, federal, local, regional policy for traditional burning as an important uh, strategy, not only generally for land stewardship, but for 
dealing with offsetting the impacts of climatic change. And there's some exciting international precedent where other nations have recognized the importance of indigenous burning for sequestering carbon and for mitigating climate effects. I'll also speak briefly about my work coordinating the first tribal and indigenous communities chapter, the California Climate Assessment uh, Project, documenting tribal participation in carbon offset markets, and a new uh, project around reframe, reframing relocation and resilience planning. Next slide, please. So this is just an overview. This is also uh, from the National Climate Assessment materials, but showing the intense impact we have of uh, catastrophic fire, particularly in California, but also elsewhere and all around the world, really thinking about the fires in Australia, um, not only a loss of property, but extreme loss of life and destruction of landscapes. So this is some of the context we're dealing with. Uh, next slide, please not only in terms of human perception, but in terms of the models that show us that wildfires will increase with the increasing aridity and higher temperatures. And this is particularly focused on the southwestern US. Uh, this is from our Southwest chapter of the National Climate Assessment. Next slide, please. So what are some ways we address this? Uh, revitalizing traditional burning. So acknowledging that traditional burning is a, a landscape-wide practice that has occurred since uh, time immemorial that has multiple functions, reducing pests, improving the health of plants and of the landscape in general, creating new growth for animals to feed on, reducing the threat of catastrophic fire by reducing fuel loading on the landscape, uh, raising the water table by reducing the amount of species that are drinking up the water, Water on the land. Um, we've seen a lot of wonderful effects from reintroducing traditional burning. Unfortunately, this is an intersection of you know, colonial policies and traditional land management. For many years, most of this century, traditional burning has been suppressed and outlawed um, as part of colonial management policies that don't recognize indigenous expertise. We now are learning, uh, of course, that fire suppression actually reduced uh, resiliency to fire and drought, and we can address that through tribally led, and I underscore that, that this is not just about um, outsiders learning about these techniques and then applying them to the exclusion of tribes, but tribally led restoration pro projects that incorporate or are guided by traditional burning. And there's some exciting collaborations happening. This picture uh, shows North Fork Mono tribal elder Ron Good, who's a very important fire educator, leading a group of our students in a burn to reinvigorate the health of these basketry plants, particularly sourberry and redbud. And I had the um, experience of returning to this site with students and community members uh, last weekend, and we were able to work with three Dunlap Mono weavers uh, gathering the new growth, the new materials from these bushes, and they were really pleased with, with their um, condition after the burning. So it was a really special experience to be able to return. And I'll just note something Ron Good said when we were out there gathering um, on the land, and there were some Cal Fire folks there too, and others doing prescribed burning. And he noted the difference he sees between prescribed burning and traditional cultural burning. He said, prescribed burning, you might burn one time and not return. With cultural burning, we always go back and continue caring for the landscape. So it was special to take part of that and see the effects on the ground. Next slide, please. So I have a few pictures here going through that experience with the students. Uh, he guided us in, in cutting back this, I think this is sourberry in this picture, uh, and piling it on the plant. Next slide. And this is working on another area of the sourberry near the red bud. Next slide, please. And then burning it. Next slide. And then as you can see, the, the student with the rake there, mixing in the ashes into the soil for the health of the soil. Next slide, please. Again, mixing in the soil. Next slide. Uh, we did a report on this work, Keepers of the Flame is what we've been calling this course, but it's really grown into a series of workshops that are engaged with community members, people at different levels um, of government, uh, different people from, from tribal fire personnel, as well as weavers. Um, coming together on the landscape to implement cultural burning and then go back and steward the landscapes afterwards. Next slide, please. 
Uh, this is a picture of two kids that were out there after the broadcast burn, uh, burning this large area which had a lot of invasive species. Uh, this was the first time I think uh, Ron engaged in a broadcast, sorry, broadcast burn on this property. Next slide, please. And this is an example of another fire workshop we had. This one is at the Tending and Gathering Garden at the Cache Creek Nature Preserve, which is an area where weavers uh, can gather plants knowing that they're free from pesticides and, and other detrimental applications. And we've been working with them and with the weavers, with the steering committee, to bring back fire on that landscape. Uh, and this is a privately owned conservation property. Next slide, please. And this is burning some of the tule just adjacent to the garden. And you can see there are two uh, different tribal fire personnel from two different tribes. So we had a lot of community participation. As both of these have been really wonderful experiences, bringing back fire on the land. Uh, this is working with two weavers, Diana Almanderas and Ardith Reed, and one of our students, Chris Adlam, uh, lighting the deer grass. Next slide, please. So some of the policy directions we are going with this focus on, on cultural burning, we're thinking about how do we clarify the differences between cultural burning and prescribed burning and the importance of relationship to land and stewardship of land over time. We're thinking about cultural burning, traditional burning as a strategy for mitigating the effects of climate change. And we're looking to uh, state, national, and international approaches. We're working with a, a woman from the Nature Conservancy, very interested in the Australian program that provides payment to members of Aboriginal communities to conduct traditional burning. So could that be something that's in place here where there's enough recognition of the positive impact of traditional burning that it's not only enabled but very specifically supported. So at the state level, just supporting ongoing efforts to encourage funding and regulatory support for cultural burning, tribally led burning, uh, encouraging that respectful knowledge exchange. Both of these workshops have been a wonderful opportunity to engage in, in sharing knowledge and not in an extractive way, um, not in a way that that leaves out the communities that hold the knowledge, but that is led by them. And encouraging support for indigenous leadership at all levels in conducting indigenous burning and in developing the institutions that support traditional burning. Next slide, please. Um, you can see one of the pictures from, from the work with Ron Good is featured on the cover of the uh, chapter in the California Climate Assessment. This was the first chapter to focus on tribal and indigenous communities within California, uh, primarily native author chapter, uh, really looking throughout the state on not only climate change impacts, but indigenous leadership in responding to those impacts. Next slide. Uh, some of the takeaways from that chapter, I don't think I'll read through these all, but just encourage you to look at the chapter, underscores that tribes face, face the significant and extreme impacts of climate change, that tribes have been monitoring climate change, uh, both through traditional cultural practice and observation and through tribal environmental programs. And all of these sets of knowledge are necessary to inform tribally led adaptation and resilience, that tribes are leading the way with innovative traditional based strategies that include restoration, can include carbon sequestration and sustainable development. There are lots of wonderful examples that we highlight in the chapter and in chapters of the National Climate Assessment. And that these climate actions and solutions are, are different than other solutions uh, from, from the government or maybe non-native communities in that they're explicitly intergenerational, rooted in history and place and honor responsibility, reciprocity and indigenous land ethics. And that there are specific recommendations that we also highlight for stewardship of homelands, for how to fund research and monitor Monitoring, monitoring when it's appropriate to collaborate and in what ways. Next slide, please. This is an example of some of the work in that chapter. This is an amazing table by Professor Don Hankins, who is at uh, CSU Chico in Geography and Planning, and he talks about specific impacts, the evidence by which you see and note those impacts and what it means for Indigenous people who are caring for the land. Next slide, please. 
So I'll talk briefly about uh, carbon offsets. This is a whole area that it can be, I think, very controversial and, and, and concerning in some ways. California has a robust uh, cap and trade program. Covered entities, so those that, that produce the most emissions, can purchase credits to offset up to 8% of their emissions under a degree, decreasing cap, meaning that they have to reduce their emissions over time but they can purchase offsets for up to 8%. So two California Native nations currently have offset projects, and then several other tribes around the nation in the Southwest, in the Pacific Northwest, and in Alaska also have offset projects on California's uh, carbon market. So some of the benefits um, we're seeing is that there's a, a financial incentive uh, to reduce emissions, and there are within that opportunities for tribes to generate projects that meet their own priorities. So it has to be uh, centered on the tribe's priorities. And in the case that I'll talk about very briefly, it enabled the buyback of tribal land that had been out of tribal jurisdiction for at least 50 years, probably more, probably more like a century. So, but some of the challenges are, does it really impact emissions? And what about the ongoing impacts at the communities where the emissions are occurring? And so I've been very interested in how can carbon offset protocols address justice and equity, and can they really? And can sovereign engagement by tribes with the carbon market end up in a win-win for climate tribes and for communities impacted by emissions? And this is just a broad question. Next slide, please. So I worked with um, a graduate student who is now a professor, Dr. Caitlin Reed at Humboldt State University, to write an article over a period of years about the Yurok Tribes Carbon Projects. It's just out in the Stanford Environmental Law Journal. And, you know, we looked at the Yurok Tribes complex process of uh, developing these carbon offset projects, which enabled the purchase of over 50,000 acres of their homeland back. And it fit within their priorities of how they wanted to steward the forest and uh, enable them to get the land back from a large timber land owner. So overall, definitely a positive um, for the tribe. But we are also thinking about what are, you know, the broader opportunities as well as concerns and challenges associated with tribal engagement in the carbon market. Next slide, please. So uh, just to, to move forward, I don't want to take too much time, so there's plenty of time for our other presenter. I'm also engaged in educational activities regarding Indigenous climate leadership. Uh, I've been working with the Knowledge Action Network. Uh, which is a collaboration between University of California and California State University faculty to curate climate change curriculum. We have multiple modules online. I did a brief one working with a graduate student, Chris Adlam, again, who also worked on the Burning Project on an Indigenous leadership in uh, offsetting climate impacts. Also getting ready to teach a course with the um, my friend Darcy Houck, who's currently chief counsel for the California Energy Commission, uh, featuring indigenous community leaders in climate adaptation, looking particularly at energy infrastructure, examples of tribes developing microgrids and developing um, facilities that, that take less energy, conservation issues, getting lands back, um, and hands-on restoration work and water quality and quantity work. So, and just broadly engaging with Native Land Trusts, a group of Native Land Trusts that includes five Native Land Trusts, in four in California and one in Alaska, uh, that are really, I think, on the front lines of climate adaptation and stewardship on their lands. And those include the Amamutsu Land Trust, the Native American Land Conservancy, the Kumeyaay Degenio Land Conservancy, the Maidu Summit Conservancy, and the Native Conservancy in Alaska. And all of them are leaders in climate adaptation and mitigation in their own homelands and areas. Next slide. And that whole focus on, on native land trust, but also on just uh, collaborating with tribes around not only getting lands back and getting jurisdiction back over lands, but removing harmful infrastructure that may be off of tribal lands. I want to recognize the influence of Joe Hostler at Yurok on my thinking. I uh, interviewed him a few years ago or started a process of an interview with um, DWR for this climate con conversation series and we asked him about impacts of climate change he had seen and I remember him saying you know how can we talk about 
climate change impacts when we're dealing with an already stressed system in terms of the Klamath River and all of the dams on the Klamath. So just the importance of removing that infrastructure that was placed in a, you know, from a colonial mindset of what was good for the land and the waterscape, and that continues to cause challenges that are only exacerbated by climate impacts of increasing heat and aridity. So that's uh, the lower two pictures refer to the dam removal on the Klamath, that process of removing four dams. Uh, the picture on the right is of a um, rendering of the possibilities for a historic shell mound site in Berkeley, uh, near where I-80 and University Avenue meet, led by the Sogoreate Land Trust and Indian people organizing for change, indigenous-led organizations working on stewarding, reclaiming, um, taking care of places even in urban areas. And the Maidu Summit Consortium banner on the top refers to the return of lands to uh, mountain Maidu people through the Stewardship Council land divestiture process. Next slide, please. And one last uh, slide here before I conclude is that a new idea I've been working a little bit on is what do new climate adaptation institutions look like that combine elements of what we now know as community land trusts that focus a little bit more on affordable housing and conservation land trusts that may work to protect and steward land bases for maximum resilience, especially in climate change contexts. So how could these institutions work to set aside land in both public and private jurisdictions? Could they be sites to showcase best practices in stewardship, including cultural burning? And can they be indigenous led, but also in a way that creates space for other communities that face environmental injustices and are being displaced by climate change? Next slide. And just these are some guiding considerations, respectful collaboration, recognizing the sovereign status of our partners, responding to their concerns, uh, protecting intellectual property, recognizing indigenous authority and observations and knowledge, uh, recognizing the extreme impacts of climate change on indigenous people, and uh, elevating the fact that indigenous people are innovating diverse climate mitigation strategies. Next slide. So these are some of our, our next steps here, uh, continuing to develop hands-on learning to educate not only our, you know, some of our students who will be for future agency folks, but some that are future tribal leaders as well, uh, and just supporting the work that they and their, their nations are already doing. Okay, I'll stop there to leave enough time for the other presenter. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you, Beth Rose. That was a wonderful introduction. I cannot thank you enough. Um, so much wonderful content, a lot of interest, I know, from attendees and a lot of questions that we'll get to. But thank you for setting the stage and, and sharing all of that. With that, we will uh, introduce our next panelist and hear from her. Uh, just a reminder that you can submit your questions through the GoToWebinar control panel throughout, and we'll get to uh, many of those as we can when we get to our discussion. With that, I want to introduce Sarah Smith. Sarah is the Midwest Tribal Resilience Liaison hired by the College of the Menominee Nation as part of the Sustainable Development Institute. In this capacity, she serves as the liaison between tribes of the Midwest, the Bureau of Indian Affairs, and climate science researchers to identify and address research gaps in climate, natural, and cultural resources, as well as improve outreach and capacity building. Sarah is a direct descendant of the Oneida Nation of Wisconsin and holds a Bachelor's of Science in Biology and First Nation Studies from the University of Wisconsin at Green Bay, as well as a science, uh, Master's of Science degree in Ecology from the State University of New York, College of Environmental Science and Forestry. We are so, so happy to have Sarah with us here today. Sarah, thank you so much for joining us on this webinar. Thank you so much. Um, Sigus Kwahweku, Sarah Smith Yungiats, Onio Teaganii, Okale Wagwaho Nawagadolodo. So, hello everyone. My name is Sarah Smith, um, and I am from the Oneida Nation. I'm Wolf Clan, and I'm coming to you today from St. Paul, Minnesota, um, traditionally Dakota land. Uh, and I'm here to talk about tribal resilience in the Midwest. Uh, and one of the tools I was really fortunate to be part of, and still am, which is Dibag and Jigadeg Anishinaabe is a twad. Um, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, next slide. So Dominique did a really great introduction, so I won't go over all this again with you. Um, but I grew up just south of my reservation in Appleton, Wisconsin. 
Um, so the Oneida Nation is up by Green Bay. And um, I went to the university trying to figure out how to um, incorporate environmental knowledge and ecology in First Nation studies. And so that's what I did with my master's work over at SUNY ESF in Syracuse, New York. Um, and then after that, I worked with the Stockbridge Muncie Nation, um, which is in Wisconsin, right below the Menominee Nation. Um, and then currently I work um, for the College of Menominee Nation. Next slide. And so in my capacity as the Midwest Tribal Resilience Liaison, um, like Dominique mentioned, I collaborate between BIA, the Northeast Climate Adaptation Science Center, and all of our consortium partners um, in the Midwest region and work with the, the tribes here on climate resilience and adaptation planning. Next slide. So the thing I wanted to highlight today um, that I was really fortunate to be part of is a tribal climate adaptation menu. Um, so the title for it is Debagan Jiki Dag Dag Anishinaabe is a Twad. Um, so my Ojibwe is still really rusty um, and I'm working on that. Um, so real briefly, the title isn't a literal translation into um, a tribal climate adaptation menu, um, but it talks about doing things in the Anishinaabe way or in the original way. Um, and so this photo here is kind of the inception of the menu itself. Um, some of the members of our author team are in this photo. And what's going on here is that um, some of our member team went to a NIAX workshop, which is the Northern Institute of Applied Climate Science. And they were having a workshop on forested watersheds um, in response to climate change. And so at these workshops, people can bring projects to work on. And these folks here brought a project concerning monomen or wild rice, um, which is a really culturally significant species or, or a significant being um, to the Anishinaabe um, tribes in the area. And so they were working in this workshop and they realized that although the menu they were working with was good, um, it was really missing some of the key values um, and tribal perceptions on how to go about um, working with our relatives or these species. And so a lot of the menus that NIAX has put together um, have been very reflective of the Western science and more of this resource centric perspective. And so this need to create a new menu um, that was focused on indigenous knowledge and kin centric perspectives um, was born. Next slide. And so the um, it's primarily developed for the use in indigenous communities. Um, with tribal naturals, natural resource staff, um, but also with non-Indigenous partners too. So this menu helps to bridge communication barriers uh, for non-tribal persons or organizations that are interested in Indigenous approaches and working with tribal communities. Um, and the menu itself is designed to be used across diverse ecosystems and scales and also different management values. And so um, that's, that's kind of the, the real brief overview of what this menu is like. Next slide. So this is sort of our first edition of the menu. It's based primarily on Ojibwe and Menominee perspectives, language, culture, and values. Um, the menu itself is meant to be adaptable. Um, so the author team, we are primarily Midwestern based, um, which was reflective in um, a lot of the, the topics we have in the menu, um, but it can be adaptable to other communities that are dealing with issues that maybe we don't cover. Um, so that could include things like sea level rise, 
um, wildfires, drought, things like that. And it's also adaptable to incorporate um, their unique language and their culture and values in there as well. Next slide. Um, so something really unique about this menu is um, there are these guiding principles at the beginning. And um, we felt that this was really important to have in the menu, especially for those non-tribal partners working with tribal communities. Next slide. And so these guiding principles, um, and my fellow panelists actually um, talked a lot about this at the end of her presentation too. Um, so these principles help provide a framework to integrate indigenous and traditional knowledge, um, culture and language into adaptation planning. Um, so that includes TEK, um, talking with our elders, things like that. Um, it really focuses on community engagement and this um, somewhat decolonization of scientific research and methods and application um, and indigenizing that, um, especially not just on our community or our tribal lands, um, but on our co-management areas as well um, in our ceded territories. Um, in the Midwest itself, we have lots of ceded territory area um, and there are many um, tribal organizations that help manage those areas. And those were a lot of the big partners we had in this work. And so just like the menu itself, these guiding principles can also be adapted. Um, so something that may be of importance to one tribe um, might not be for another. Um, so these can be adapted for the tribal communities themselves. Next slide. Um, so real briefly, some of the things that the guiding principles talk about um, are the importance of human and non-human relationships. So really going back to this kin-centric focus on species as our relatives and as beings um, and not a resource. Um, it also highlights cultural paradigms. Um, like I said, emphasizing community engagement and decision-making making sure the community is at the table. If um, there's a non-tribal partner or organization that wants to work with them, making sure they're there on day one um, before anything gets done. So they're in the decision-making from the start. Um, and then really making sure you end a project in a good way um, and figuring out how that knowledge and that information will be um, kept and disseminated. So that might mean um, figuring out who keeps um, the data, what knowledge can be shared, um, when might that knowledge be shared um, due to sensitive timing, um, things like that. So this is kind of what the guiding principles go over in this document. Next slide. Um, and so throughout the guiding principles and the menu, we really highlight on um, these three R's of respect, reciprocity, and relationships. So decisions for our relatives were originally communal decisions and made with recognition and respect. And that's what we're really trying to get at with this menu is going back to those ways. Um, because a lot of decision making um, today for the land is made more from a manager, perspective um, on an individual and institutionalized level. Um, so really getting back to those communal ways on how we go about with our relatives. Next slide. Um, and so the menu is um, pretty long. So I'm gonna just briefly go over some of the strategies and approaches that are in the menu. Um, in total, we have 14 uh, strategies. So I'm gonna touch just on four of them right now. Um, otherwise, this could be a really long webinar. <laughs> and so the first one, strategies one to three, um, really emphasize this 
the cultural practices, tribal engagement, um, and respect towards our, our relatives. Um, so things like um, consulting cultural leaders, elders, um, being mindful um, of practices of reciprocity. Um, it could, some adaptation actions could be revitalizing um, language programs. It could be um, youth programs, wild rice camps, um, things like that. And then strategy two um, is actually the last strategy we included in this menu. Um, and it took us a while to think about this. Um, and it's learning through careful observation, um, careful and respectful observation. So for example, if a tornado were to go through an area, perhaps instead of quickly responding on, we need to fix it, we need to revegetate, um, taking a step back to see what the natural community does um, and learning from them. So it's more of this doing nothing is doing something. Next slide. And then the last one I wanted to point out um, is strategy five, um, specifically 5.2, but also 5.1. Um, so 5.1 is talking about maintaining or improving the abilities of um, communities to balance the effects of little spirits. So little spirits refer to things such as insects, um, which doesn't really get touched on in a lot of um, adaptation planning. Um, so we thought this was um, really important to have in there. Um, but then also 5.2 um, for maintaining or improving the abilities of communities to balance the effects of non-local beings. Um, so this is one that gets pulled out a lot from the menu. Um, so non-local beings is talking about invasive species. Um, so we actually, in our planning, we sat down for an entire day talking about invasive species um, because a lot of the time when we think about invasive species, we kind of have this negative connotation towards them. Um, and we wanted to change that perspective. Um, these beings are, um, they're doing what they were originally instructed to do when they were made and put on this earth. And they're just in a new place. And they're just doing what they were told and they don't have those same checks and balances. Um, so seeing them in that way and trying to understand maybe how the communities where they came from utilize these species um, and thinking about them more um, in a respectful way. So the photo on here is a what was a wild rice bed um, with the Nettawasepi uh, Huron tribe of Potawatomi in uh, Michigan. And the uh, beans that you see in the water are actually invasive cattails. So um, thinking about um, maybe how we might manage these beans in a more respectful way than you know, dredging them up, taking them out and burning them or using chemicals. Um, so really going about it in a different way. Next slide. Um, so we were able to publish this back in April of 2019. Um, and so this is relatively new. It took us over two years to create this menu. Um, but since then, um, we've been putting this travel adaptation menu or TAM to work. Next slide. And so over the course of last year alone, we were able to do four workshops. Um, and so our first one was actually right before we published the menu. Um, it was in its final draft form. And that was held in Cloquet, Minnesota um, by the Fond du Lac Reservation. And um, we had about 30 participants with that one. Um, our next one was up with the Bay Mills Indian community in um, the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. Um, and that one was really great because 
their tribal college students um, came to the workshop. Um, and that was really great to see them and then also getting different perspectives um, on the projects they brought. Um, we had one um, with the Aquasasne Mohawk in New York as well. And then our final one last year was with the Menominee Nation. Um, and that one was really interesting as well because we had folks from Florida come, so dealing with sea level rise. Um, one was working on a Wisconsin naturalist program um, and um, including cultural values and language with the, the Ho-Chunk Nation. So as these workshops have been going on, um, more and more people are bringing projects that maybe we didn't initially think about um, like sea level rise, um, but we're able to still work with the menu on those projects to help with the tribe's adaptation plans. Next slide. And so um, what's next for us um, with the, the tribal adaptation menu is we have a workshop coming up in a few weeks um, with the Red Cliff Band. And that uh, workshop is actually filled at capacity. Um, it got filled within the first week and a half of the Save the Date coming out, but we are planning future workshops in 2020. Um, so if you're interested, um, please contact me. Um, and then I can also send a link um, to maybe Dominique, who can send it to everyone um, with the tribal adaptation menu. So Yongo, and Definitely. thank you. Thank you, Sarah. That was just wonderful. I'm so impressed with this menu and have uh, so many questions. I will certainly send out that link to everyone. So thank you for uh, providing that great resource. With that, uh, we go into our moderated discussion and we wanna make sure that we can hear from you. So if you'd like to participate, you can submit a question through the question box and we'll get to as many as we can. We already have um, many, many wonderful questions. Um, I'm gonna take the moderator's prerogative and just start with one of my own and then we're gonna go straight to, to questions from, from the attendees. But I, I wanna start, and Sarah, this will be for you first and then um, Beth Rose would love to hear if you have something to add after that. I loved this um, strategy 5.2 where you talked about non-local beings because we know uh, that, that invasive species sort of have a, a new meaning as we address climate change and we know that species are migrating because the climate is changing. Um, so I love that idea that, that there's some respect and kind of consideration of, of the species themselves. Can you maybe give an example uh, from your work on that strategy, strategy specifically and how you've seen it implemented? Um, and then after Sarah, maybe Beth Rose, if, if you have anything to add, would love to hear from you on this as well. Yeah, um, so the example um, I was talking about real briefly earlier with invasive cattails is one thing that some tribes are trying to figure out what's the best um, method to either manage them or remove them. Um, so um, figuring out, you know, where they where they came from, what they're used for. Um, some of them can be used. Um, well, in one community, one of them is looking at using the cattails for fiber. Um, so removing them and using them in that kind of way. Um, and then there are other things in the menu too, um, when thinking about, you know, a, uh, with uh, migration of species that's projected to happen. Um, so that's kind of um, a slower step for, you know, non-local beings to move where they're not originally from. Um, and really speaking with um, communities where they came from, um, how they're used, um, and that kind of stuff. So, yeah, uh, I think this different perspective uh, is really, um, really interesting. And when we've talked with, um, you know, non-tribal partners such as Forest Service and DNR, it really gets them thinking about maybe different ways they can they can go about um, managing invasive species in their areas. Mm -hmm. I really like that approach too. I mean, I might only say that one of the challenges we see is out competition of of native species. And so it's it's not necessarily about full annihilation of the non-native species, but just 
reducing their prevalence so that the native species can still thrive. Certainly, and you certainly talked a little bit about that in, in the cultural burning. Uh, a question for you, Beth Rose, and then certainly if, um, Sarah, you have anything to add. You mentioned the in the very early about the Rising Voices Network. I think this was uh, in relation to, to climate migration. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about that organization? Sure. I mean, it's a wonderful organization. It's um, I haven't been for a couple of years, but it's composed of participants that come from tribal colleges and universities. Uh, from from academia, from communities, from agencies, from tribes, really discussing the impacts of climate change and then making policy recommendations and being active on the policy level. It's a very uh, powerful and empowering group of people. Wonderful. Yeah. Thank you for that. That was a go ahead, Sarah. Oh yeah, I would um, definitely agree with um, Beth Rose as well. Um, and I just wanted to mention that they have an upcoming conference um, at the end of April that'll be over in Washington, um, if people are interested in attending it. Um, Wonderful. Maybe we can send, send out some information about that conference as well. Good. Um, another question from someone here. Um, they're asking if uh, the HEMAS principles contribute at all to the strategies in the menu. Is that something that, that you're familiar with, Sarah? Um, I am not, but I'd be really interested okay. to know more about that. Okay, Beth Rose, are you familiar? Otherwise, we might we might not have any good answer to this one. That might be okay. No, sorry. Okay, that's okay. Um, good. Uh, another question from the audience. Um, so this was a little bit about the, you know, you talked to Beth Rose about cultural uh, burning versus more prescribed burning. And I love that idea that um, I think this was something that was was told to you that prescribed burning, they don't come back. I And I'm wondering, and maybe this is something you're researching, do you have any um, evidence or, or studies that, that look at kind of the, the difference in terms of the effect on the land of prescribed versus the more traditional burning? Yes, I mean, I always reference people who I think are, are kind of leading scholars around indigenous fire science, indigenous pyrogeography, and that would be Frank Lake, Dr. Frank Lake with the Forest Service Southwest Research Station, uh, Don Hankins, Dr. Don Hankins, whose work I pointed to in the climate assessment at CSU Chico, and Dr. Jonathan Long, also Forest Service Research Station, um, as well as Ron Good, Jared Aldern, Dr. Jared Aldern. Um, and others have, have written about this. There's some different Forest Service technical publications about the effect of you know, continuing to return and burn um, under oaks, for example, and the positive effect on not only on the, on the community of species, but on the community of people to be out doing that work together and, and sharing that knowledge within the community. Yes, I love that idea that it's not just the effect, but it's the effect of the people who are involved. That that makes a lot of sense. Uh, Sarah, a, a question for you. Um, you talked a little bit about your strategy too, which I loved. Learning through careful and respectful observation, um, and you you know gave this this uh, example of the tornado that may be waiting to see how natural systems recover before acting. Can can you talk a little bit more about that? We have a, a question of you know how that might be applied in in different contexts. Yeah, um, so the tornado example is, is one that gets touched on a lot, um, but it could be things um, also like flooding. So in the Midwest, we have a lot of flooding issues with uh, extreme weather events that have been happening more and more often. Um, so in those situations, there's one tribe in particular um, that has been noticing um, certain areas getting flooded constantly over and over again. Um, so they are actually in the works of re-meandering the river to what it used to be um, because it was channelized. And so with these events, they kind of did the stepping back to watch what happened and it was this continuous flooding. So their approach is to re-meander the river and re-establish its original floodplain. Um, so things like that don't uh, keep happening, especially with um, the increase in extreme weather events we've been having here. 
That's a great example. I wonder, Beth, does this idea, uh, Beth Rose, the idea of respectful observation before action, is that something that you come across in, in your research and work at all? Yes, I think it's very resonant with just the respectful approach to watching how the land and other species react and not sort of having, embracing the hubris that humans know best, uh, but kind of a listening approach. Yes, I love that as well. Good. Um, a, a question for, for you, Beth Rose. Um, you talked a little bit about the policy advocacy work that you do um, and some of the barriers that you've seen to the cultural burning. Um, are there other uh, cultural, uh, culturally traditional stewardship practices um, and adaptation strategies for climate change that you see having policy barriers as, that you might work on? Mm, definitely. I mean, I've, I've worked a lot with land trusts. And so kind of looking at the tools that are available to conservation entities, but then how could they be used by tribes or by native nonprofits? And it's it's not necessarily a tool that works for every everyone, but it, it can be useful just for bringing land back into tribal jurisdiction so that a host of different relationships to the land can be enacted. All different types of stewardship, uh, in, including ceremony, including uh, bringing back fire include maybe uh, different ways of working with water um, so i feel like my role has been to work on developing some of these tools that people might be used people might use to then exercise the type of, of stewardship they would like to and to be able to protect their their places that's wonderful sarah do you, do you have anything to add to that i imagine that this is something that you you've seen in, in working with tribal communities through your uh, menu as well yeah, um, the one thing that comes to mind is um, when we're talking about species migration um, and how that is going to affect tribal communities, um, you know, across the nation, um, because we have our reserved rights, um, either on our reservation or our ceded territories, but with those species moving, we really have to work um, with Park Service, Forest Service, um, across different political boundaries as well, especially um, if species are moving into Canada um, that we might not be able to access anymore. Um, so those kinds of laws and, and thinking about that um, is really on a lot of people's minds, um, especially for the tribes that are really close to that um, political border of US and Canada. Yes, certainly. And it sounds like this is a great tool. And, and so um, you've made it adaptable. I imagine you'll have some interest uh, from people who are listening today, if not tribal community, at least certainly the partners working with them, maybe both um, that come from, from those border communities. Well, with that, we uh, this hour has just gone by so quickly. I'm sorry we did not get to go to all of the questions that we had from the attendees. But I do want to just take a moment um, and wrap up first by sharing that we have the second part of this webinar series on indigenous approaches to conservation. So a few different topics going beyond climate change. It will be March 5th, that's in two weeks at a noon mountain time. So just one hour earlier, we have a couple wonderful panelists uh, for that. I'm very excited for that second part of the webinar series to, to continue sharing and some of the information that we talked about today. And mostly, I just want to thank our panelists, uh, Dr. Beth Rose Middleton and Sarah Smith. I am just uh, blown away by all of the wonderful knowledge that you shared today. And um, your communities are, are lucky to have you. I'm excited about all the good work that you're doing. And I know that our attendees are excited to get their hands on some of these links and resources um, here in the future. So uh, Dr. Beth Rose, thank you. And Sarah, thank you so much for joining us today. Well, thank you for having me. Yes, thank you so much. Wonderful. This is Dominique Gomez at the Salazar Center for North American Conservation at Colorado State University. Thank you much, so much for joining us on our Connecting for Conservation webinar. And have a wonderful afternoon, everyone. And you will receive a recording um, in, the, in your email within the next few days. Thank you again. Bye-bye. Thank you.